Let's go ahead and get started today. So we have much to cover, not a whole lot of time, so we'll just dive right in. <clears throat> so just logistics. So in just a few minutes, we're going to go over homework one solution. Uh, we're then going to talk about the uh, midterm exam, which is next Monday. And we're going to spend most of the class today going through uh, economic statement conversion. Lecture note three was posted online to the file section this morning. So <clears throat> let's start out and talk about <coughs> logistics. So again, Wednesday, Bloomberg's going to be here all day to do advanced training on the terminal. So you're expected to be here and, you know, be nice to them. Uh, they're also here for recruiting, so you feel free to take advantage of that. And again, they are given a list of all the things I think that they should cover. But if you have any specific questions, like the one that was just asked, can we track with the portfolio tool, how we're doing in the stock game, like ask those questions as well. They're just a good resource because they are the people who actually are behind the software. All right. So that's Wednesday. Monday is going to be midterm one. So later today, you're going to get homework two. Very important. I adjusted the deadline on homework two, so it is now due this Friday, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, with a 5.15 absolute closing of the deadline, as opposed to next Monday. The reason why I moved up the deadline for homework two is because homework two is very similar to the midterm exam. So I wanted to get it scored on Friday, so you can actually see it. It's going to be auto-scored. Okay, so basically you'll submit an Excel file with your work, you'll type in a few key numbers. If you match the numbers, then you know you got it right, and that's how you'll know you're great. Then, at the end of day Friday, after it's turned in, I'll also post a practice midterm, which I've used in a previous semester, with a practice solution. Okay, so the midterm is going to be on Monday, and so to make sure you have the answer and one more practice, I moved up homework two to Friday. Okay, just letting you know. And I also put another practice, economic state conversion and solution online as well. So you have that right now, right? So, and that's what we're about to go through in class. One word on the exam. So the exam will be given during your registered class time on Monday. So if you happen to be skipping sections, you need to take the exam during the time that you're registered in the system that you're also in that section for ELMS. Okay. So, for example, if this is the 12:30 class, but you're registered for the 2 o'clock class, you happen to be sitting in this, you have to take it with the 2 o'clock class. Right. So, what's going to happen is you don't have to take it physically in this room. You can take it anywhere where you have access to a computer and a uh, web browser and Excel. However, you take it on a timer based on your section start time. So, you'll go to Elms if you ever take an online exam. You'll click on the link for midterm one at, in your case, this is the 12.30 section, at 12.30, and then at 2 p.m., I'll give you 90 full minutes, it auto-submits. So if you don't type in anything, you get a zero on the exam, okay? So by 2 p.m., you would have to upload your Excel file and type in some specific <laughs> answers that are going to be auto-scored, and you have that 90-minute window, okay? So you can start whenever you want, but you got to start and finish within that 90-minute window, okay? And that's the exam. Right, and it's a very straightforward exam because all it is is it's going to be an Excel file that you'll click on the link, you'll download the Excel file, you will convert it. Okay. Now again, you're on the honor code, so don't cheat. Right, so working or collaborating with anybody is an honor code violation. Last semester, I had to put people before the honor council. Some of them got really bad things happen to them in their lives and their parents blame me. Right, and I don't like that. I don't like it for the student, I don't like it for the parents, I don't like it for you. So just don't let that be you. Right, so it's not worth it. So basically, you're just on the honor code. You'll be taking it during class time for your section next Monday. Then next Wednesday will be our next lecture, where we'll get into, I think, multiples or wherever is on this, the syllabus that's coming up. All right, questions about any of that, logistically? OK, great. <clears throat> so let's talk about homework one. So this was the file that you started with. And I'll post a solution, but I just want to make sure everybody knows how to do this. So for Procter & Gamble, we'll start out with the key value drivers. So we would have looked up PG, U.S. Equity. And the first thing you could have done is you could have gone to the WAC screen. And their cost of equity right now is 7.4%. So 
So for here, we would type in 7.4%. Okay, then we would have gone to the EEO screen and we would have used for forward year two, one, two, 18, 19, right, this data. So again, in the readings for the book that you had, it talks about why we use and have standardized on forward year two for forward earnings. And so in Bloomberg, it's easy to figure out what your forward year two is. Estimate, estimate, one, two. Okay. Typically, forward year one is the uncompleted current year. That's considered a forward year. And then forward two years, the next full year of the business. So in this case, it would have been 2019. So you start out with net income adjusted was... What was that 11,905? <clears throat> the ROE would have been three years of expected ROE. So if you did it and divided, you'd typed in point, <clears throat> was that, point one, 195 plus point two one two. plus 0.241 divided by three. So basically around 21.6% is the expected return on equity. And right now, based on the time that you did it, probably not gonna change too much, but right now they're trading at a forward PE for 2019 of 18. And that would be at just get an extra couple decimal places here. So two point three. Nope. Five. Two point four eight. Something like that. Somewhere around two four ish. Again, their stock price is changing. So you might get two, four, two, four, five, two, three, nine, something like that. But plus or minus 10 basis points is going to be that answer. All right, questions about that G? Everybody get the G? Yes? All good? Okay. All right. So this is an important exercise because number one, it was helping you apply the KVD. But number two, what it also is going to illustrate is that um, when we do multiples, we're going to find that hidden in the multiples are some assumptions. So by using the multiples and the academic assumptions, we can back into some numbers that will help us in valuation. So for example, we need to do a what's called a continuing value or terminal value for a company. One of the terminal values is what's their long-term G into perpetuity. Well, what most people do is they guess. They say, oh, US GDP is about 3%, so it must be 3%. Okay? And I'm not saying that's right or wrong, it's just what people do. But as to us, what we're going to do to make your lives easier is because we actually know the formulas for, for example, PE or enterprise value to EBIT, then we can actually back out a G based on the multiple, which is exactly what you just did. So this is a process that will help us in a few weeks when we build our valuation models to use real data to figure out what multiples or what assumptions people are using for the multiples of the trading companies. Now, we don't have to agree with them, but if nothing else, we know that somewhere around 2.4, 2.5 is the G the market's using right now for Procter & Gamble, for better or for worse. Yes? So I did it pretty early, a little early last week. I got it like a different G. I got 1.7. Yeah. Uh, what kind of PE did you get? Um, uh, my PE was 18.07. Okay. And um, except my whack was at 6.8. Oh, that's what the yeah. burger was at lower. Mm, you had to use cost of equity. Mm hmm. Cost of equity, yeah. Cost of equity is 6.8. So you're saying this number was 6.8 or that number was 6.8? Um, WAC is 6.8. Cost of equity is 7.4. I'll, I'll, I'll check. Check your I screenshot. Got, I got 7.9. Yeah, 7.9. So that number was 6.8 last week? Yeah. 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 Wow. All right, if your screenshots match, we'll give you credit for it. Okay, cool. All right, I can't imagine it changed that much, but could have. <clears throat> it's absolutely possible, yeah. Yeah, I don't think we take screenshots in this case. I think it was EPO. No, I feel like the screenshot is good. Yeah. 6.8, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, well, if somebody shows me a screenshot, you use 6.8, then we'll accept 6.8. Okay. 
I got you. Okay. He's got you. He's got you covered. There we go. So if you guys didn't submit it, then he's got you covered. All right. <clears throat> but regardless, at 6.8, it would be – and if that's really true, then there's just been a spectacular rise in interest rates in the last week, which is probably what's been happening. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that's pretty much unheard of <laughs> to go up 60 basis points in one week. But regardless, uh, if I look at this at 6.8 – then you get down to a G of, what's it, 2.1 you said? 1.7, actually. Yeah, that's a huge difference between those two Gs. So here's the thing. You know, if you work backwards into this over the last week, that in order to maintain the same stock price because interest rates are now higher, that Procter & Gamble needs an extra 1% growth into the perpetuity to justify its current stock price. And if you wonder why stock prices fell like 1,500 points, there you go. That's exactly why. I mean, you can see the direct line from Davos when Trump said weak dollar to basically people pulling their cash outside the U.S. Because if I have a 3% yield on a 10-year treasury, and I'm using rounding up, it was 2.5, <clears throat> and the currency goes 5% against me, then suddenly all my foreign investors have negative yields. And nobody wants to own basically long dated US dollars. So we're gonna run a one point one trillion dollar budget deficit this coming year. People have pulled off to the side and said, I'm not gonna with the value in currency gonna buy US debt. Interest rates spike, discount rates go up, stock markets crash. This should not be a surprise. But nonetheless, what should be a surprise is how fast it's happening in the marketplace. And that's what I mean. So ultimately Procter and Gamble's cash flows discount at a higher rate, you need more cash flows. That would be the change in D. It's, it's basically academically, if nothing else, you actually understand better than the average person reading the Wall Street Journal why the market's doing what it's doing by using the KVD equation. But again, for purposes of this, that was the first half of the assignment. Now, let's go back to the second half of the assignment. Put this here. Second half of the assignment was to go to the RV screen to make sure that you had the GIX country of domicile. Make sure that you had under global settings, market cap weighted average. And then you go to custom. Actually, sorry, markets first, beta. So we got an industry beta and we got a Procter and Gamble beta. So is Procter and Gamble sensitive to changes in the economy? Not so much because their beta is 0.42. And what's key to the grade is that you use the words 0.42. Okay? If you just said not so much, no credit. So that's the point. 0.42, industry 0.5, much less sense of the economy. We just know that about the industry. All right. Second question. What's going on with their spread? Right now, as the latest filing, about 19% ROIC for the industry, about 7% WAC. 12 for PNG, 6.77 WAC. So what do you think? Is this an attractive industry? Attractive of industry, but they don't have yeah, he's got the right answer there. He said attractive industry, but they don't have competitive advantage. So they're still an above average performer because they're in the good industry, but they're not performing better than their peers, so we're not demonstrating competitive advantage. That's what I need you to get out of homework one. Questions? Yes, sir. Can you argue that because of the beta being lower than the average, it's not a question of having a lower or higher beta as being right or wrong. It would just mean that they're less volatile and then perceived as assuming that there's not a lot of debt things going on across the firms, that they're having lower perceived levels of risk. So if I'm taking less risk, I'll have a lower beta. That's not right or wrong. Because I could be taking more risk and get better returns, because that would be the point. A higher cost of capital should have a higher ROIC. Lower cost of capital, maybe a lower ROIC. And that would be expected. So that's why what matters for the relative performance is not the relative ROIC, it's the relative spread. That's why we're using spread, not just ROIC. Yes? I have a question about spread. Mm -hmm. I know last class, the class before online, we talked about how if it's a negative spread, shrink, like the, just holding by that rule. Is there any exceptions? Because I was like looking at stocks, we we're both looking at stocks and just looking around. And we saw a lot of companies with a negative spread that <clears throat> were going, shooting for a high, higher growth. So the difference between accounting and finance is accounting is backward looking mm -hmm. and Finance is forward-looking. Mm -hmm. To some degree, these numbers are a current snapshot. Mm -hmm. They don't represent the future. Mm -hmm. So the real question is the incremental dollar. Okay. 
So if the incremental dollar gets a positive spread, you want to reinvest it. If the incremental dollar does not get a positive spread, then you probably don't want to reinvest it. You want to pay it out. That's your decision rule. So just because the industry is doing poorly now doesn't mean that the industry is not attractive for later. So that would be a consideration. Same thing is true. Just because the industry is attractive now doesn't mean it's going to be attractive later. So what we really have to think about, and that's why we have to be future oriented, is what is this future spread going to be? But at least as we get started, I needed to introduce you to the concept of spread, and I need you at least to start to think about that. And that was homework one. Right? Any other questions about homework one? These are good questions. Okay, let's talk about lecture note three, and let's talk about economic statement conversion and homework two. So, um, <clears throat> this is lecture note three. And this is the first we did for this week. So everything we do in terms of valuation this semester is based on Medigliani Miller. This is a graphical framework of Medigliani Miller of which the McKinsey textbook process is based. So what we're primarily saying is a company's worth the sum of its future cash flows. And what we're going to do is we're going to break those cash flows into two buckets. One is going to be called operating cash flows, which are basically the cash that comes from selling products and services to customers. The other, non-operating cash flows, which are items of value that the company has, go back to this mode, um, but have nothing to do with sales. So for example, if I am <clears throat> Merck <clears throat> right now, Merck has, uh, where is it, cash of about, let's do the uh, latest filing. They got a bunch of cash <laughs> sitting in overseas accounts, primarily because <clears throat> they didn't want to repatriate and pay taxes. That's about to change under the new U.S. tax laws. So that's the point. If a company has a lot of cash, Microsoft, Apple, Google, whoever, sitting overseas, it has value, but it has nothing to do with selling the next product. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to value that separately. Same thing. If I am participant in a joint venture, and I don't run the venture, I just own another piece of some other company. Well, that's non-operating. Okay? So it has nothing to do with my sales. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to value the company by looking at its operating performance. I'm going to look at a company based on its non-operating performance. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the two together, and that's going to be called enterprise value. Okay? And because they're present valued, <clears throat> I can do that with MPV. Now, is that cash flow enterprise value that I can then use to pay off my stakeholders? Debt gets the first claim. After the debt holders are paid, whatever's left as residual goes to the shareholders, divided by shares, share price. That is enterprise DCF in a nutshell. That's the process we're going to use this semester. And so that comes from Medigliani Miller. So in order to do this very straightforward process, we have to put our financial statements into this cash flow format. Okay? So this is a map processing this semester, all on one page. So what's different about this class and McKinsey's approach than just about any other class you would take <coughs> is that we're adding an intermediate step to the valuation. Okay? So what most people have taught you in the past, they said, just go straight from the statements to the cash flows. Right? So what we're going to do is we're going to go from the statements to economic statements, economic being a rearranged cash flow statements, and then we're going to do the valuations. Okay? So here's the thing. The statements, income statement and balance sheet, are going to be rearranged the income statement into a statement called TII, total income available to investors, and TFI, total funds available to investors. Those are basically Medigliani Miller formatted statements, operating, non-operating, debt, equity. Okay. So the first step is going to basically be take the statements and put them into those four buckets. Right? And then the other thing is what's unique about this class is I used to teach in the McKinsey Analyst Training Program, and I'd have four hours to basically teach 30 to 45 very smart undergrads who have never taken a business class. So they could be pre-med, English majors, physicists, engineers, 
and I had to teach them how to do this in four hours. And it wasn't easy because they'd never taken accounting either. So I used a mnemonic, which you're going to find doesn't exist any. You talk about this mnemonic, other words, they just look at you like you're nuts, right? But I think it will help you. And so here's my mnemonic, right? When I went through these four steps, I called the operations one. So anything that's an operating cash flow one. Anything that's a non-operating cash flow is called a two. Anything that's a debt cash flow is called a three. And anything that's an equity cash flow is called a four. One plus two equals three plus four. As a matter of fact, if you do a DCF, it's one plus two minus three equals four. All right. But the whole reason for this is that it's a process called labeling, which is what we're about to do. So if you took a, a toy made of Legos and you ripped it apart and you put it back together, what's going to be key is there can be no Legos on the floor. All right. And that's what I mean by balancing statements. So if we start with balancing statements, we have to end with balancing statements. We can't forget any accounts. So what the labels will do, if you follow my suggestion, you don't have to, but I would think it would hurt you if you didn't. But basically, follow my suggestion. The labels will help you put things in the right place. And it'll make sure that when it doesn't balance, you can go back and you can say, aha, there's four ones in the balance sheet, but I only have three ones on the TFI, so I forgot to put a Lego into the new toy. So it will help you when you're frustrated trying to balance these statements. If you think you're the pro and you want to skip this, by all means, if you get it right, that's fine. But I just find, even today, when I deal with very complicated statements, it's easier for me to think of it this way. It's the way I structure it. So, back to this. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the income statement, we're going to break it up into four parts. Operating items, no plan. Non-operating items, non-operating income. Debt payments, interest expense. Equity payments, net income. We're going to take the balance sheet to do the same thing. Basically, operating items, net of operating liabilities, assets minus liabilities, is going to be called invested capital. Non-operating assets, net of non-operating liabilities, are going to be called non-operating capital. Add the two together, total funds available to investors. That's going to equal the debt financing and the equity financing of the business. Right? It doesn't matter whether you do the income statement or the balance sheet first, but what does matter is you'll need both of those converted statements to create statement number three, which is called CFI, the cash flow available to investors. And this is core to the valuation. Cash flow is basically income statement minus change in balance sheet. And that's just the nature of cash flow. So here's the point. If I take my no plat minus my change in invested capital, I get my free cash flow. Right? If I take my non-operating income, change in non-operating assets, I get my non-operating cash flow. Add the two together, CFI. Okay, yes. Yeah, and unfortunately, for purposes of the video, when I go full screen, it only records like a quarter of the screen. So you should have this in your lecture notes if you want to download and follow along. Sorry about being able to see it. It's just a limitation of the 10-year-old technology in this lab and that monitor, which goes on the fritz most of the time. So long story short, it was state-of-the-art when we first started teaching here, by the way. Even those things used to work before they had to rip them out from the wall because the fans were about to explode. All right, so back to CFI. So if you take the debt payments to the income statement, change in debt in the balance sheet, cash to debt holders, dividends minus change in equity, cash flow to shareholders. And so that's the point. If we forecast our free cash flows and discount them, operating value. Forecast non-operating cash flows, non-operating value, add the two together, enterprise value. Right? And that's the distribution to the debt holders. I can work across, I can work up and down, but that's where we need to end up in the valuation. So in order to do the valuation, we got to get through this middle process. By going through the middle process, you'll get two benefits. Number one, you're less likely to make a mistake. Because here's the problem that you've learned in previous classes. When you calculate free cash flow, you stop at free cash flow. So if you accidentally forget to put something into that free cash flow, you'll never know. You just make that mistake, right? In this process, you won't make that mistake because not only will you forecast the free cash flow, but you're going to forecast the other side of the cash flow where it went. And those two must balance, All right? So if I had 100 of cash flow, I have 100 of distribution to my investors and 100 needs to add up to 100. If they don't add up, I miss something. So this process, though frustrating, actually makes for better analysis. The other thing is think about ROIC. There's my no plat, there's my invested capital completely stripped out. That's my operating ROIC. So it also gives us much cleaner ratios and much cleaner 
analytics. So it'll suck as a process, but you'll realize the value later on as we use it throughout the semester. So <clears throat> the other insight I want to give before we get into the process is the difference between our ROIC in this class, which we'll call the operating ROIC, and what you learned in previous classes, which is the rest of the world, including Bloomberg, just calls ROIC. Right? And what they say ROIC is, is the return on the debt and equity, right? which is the return on all of the assets. But what's important here is we actually want to look at the return on the operating assets and the return on the non-operating assets, which averages out to what the rest of the world calls ROIC. And I'll give you an example of why this is important. So a few years ago, I was working with a company called Molson Coors. So here's Molson Coors. And here are their peers. And using the homework one file that you just did, this is their spread. Okay, that's the industry. Is this an attractive industry? This is beer, beverages. Looks decent. Yeah, it's positive spread, attractive. Does Molson Coors demonstrate advantage? No. <clears throat> so here's the situation three years ago. So another cool feature of Bloomberg, by the way. Add a column. ROIC, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to do customize period to years ago. I'm going to go to year minus three. So this is three years ago when I was working with them. So that was their ROIC then, 544. Four. And the WAC hasn't changed all that much. So is that attractive? That was pretty bad. Yeah, they've, they've obviously improved. So here's the point. When, when I was working with them and they had the 544, they were getting ready to gut the company, right? The, the ax was out. They were about to lay off a bunch of people, shut down some plants, reorganize, because basically Wall Street was putting a huge amount of pressure on the company saying you were an underperformer. And I was actually brought down to Fort Lauderdale to give a keynote speech to their leadership. And what I actually told them is you're not doing as poorly as you think you are. Because what I said is look at the operating ROIC and non-operating ROIC separately because this is the blend of the two. It's the company's return. This is the way Wall Street looks at it. However, if I look at the operating ROIC, and this is a custom field that you will learn how to create in Bloomberg, upcoming homework assignments. That's why Wednesday's class is important. It's 18%. I know I'm mixing time periods, but it really didn't change that much. So, yes, they're still underperforming the industry, but 18% is well above their cost of capital. And that's the beer business. That's what they make by selling beer, right? Then they have some non-operating assets, and when you put the returns of the non-operating assets and the beer business together, they make 5%. But here was an example of a company that was ready to gut the beer business because they thought the beer business was making 5% when it was actually making 18%. And if you wonder why McKinsey is so good, that's what McKinsey does that the banks don't do. Because the banks will go in and beat you up over the 5%. And they're making 5%, but the company did not understand that the 5% was not the beer business. The beer business was making 18 So here's the point. If the operating return is 18% and the average of the two is 5 what does that say about the non-operating return? It's negative. It's terrible. Okay? So, so basically, that's the problem is the problem was the non-operating assets. So what I actually looked up is they, at the time, had a big black hole of a joint venture called SAB Miller, right? And they put huge amount, hundreds of millions of dollars, this joint venture wasn't making any money. And it was killing the results of the company. But the problem was not the beer business, it was the joint venture, but everybody thought it was the company because they were just looking at the company ROIC. And I'm not saying that that's the way that investors aren't gonna judge you, because as an investor, I gave you cash, make the money. I don't care how you make it, you owe me. That's ROIC. But from an insight standpoint, the operating values, the non-operating values are different, and they go up at separate rates, which means we're going to forecast them differently. So if Molson Coors were to gut the SAB Miller acquisition by selling it to Anheuser-Busch InBev and start focusing on beers, selling beer, is it any surprise that three years later, they went as a company from 5 to 11? Because they just had more of the 18 in their business mix. Right? So that's what I mean by... We get better insight, and to some degree goes back to the question you asked earlier, which is if I think future-oriented, I'm making five now, if I keep selling beer at 18, my five is going to go up. And that's exactly what has happened to Molson Course. 
Does that make sense to everybody? So that's another reason why we're doing this labeling process because by labeling, we'll get a much clearer view of what this operating ROIC is. And we'll understand what the non-operating ROIC is because we'll have broken it out, okay, by rearranging the statements. So let's talk about the statements. This is covered in the book, but we're going to use the simple example that's right out of the book for the balance sheet and the income statement. <coughs> let's start with the balance sheet. I've done this in the previous class. Let me wipe these out. Okay. So you're going to do this in Excel, and this will be very similar to the uh, home, to the midterm, except it'll just be bigger and scarier. But the process is still the same. All right. <clears throat> so here's the thing. First thing we want to do, so let me wipe these out, is go through a process called labeling, which will help us. So one, two, three, four. Operating, not our ones, non-operating cash flows, twos, debt cash flows, threes, equity cash flows, fours. One, two, three, four. Cash on a balance sheet. One, two, three, or four. One. One. All right. So for purpose of this exercise, one, but here's the trick. Cash is a one or a two. Could also be it could be excess cash, which is non-operating. All right. So on the midterm and on your homework, it'll say operating cash and excess cash. Operating cash is one, excess cash is two. So again, here's the way I think of it. One of my first jobs in high school was drive through a Burger King. <clears throat> this is back in the day when people weren't using as many credit cards. So at the beginning of my shift, the manager and I would count my till in the, in the office. We'd walk it out to the register, put it in the register, and basically turn a knob to say, start the register all over with this amount of cash in it. I'd run my shift. At the end of the shift, turn the knob, print out, back in the day, not computers, basically uh, print out the amount of stuff that was bought. We'd take it to the back. We'd count the cash. He'd leave the same amount that I started with, and he'd take out the rest, okay, so in the till. And so here's the point. The money that was in the till that never left the till is called operating cash, all right, because the Burger King franchise could never pay that out for salaries. They couldn't use it for anything else because they actually needed it to, to make change is part of their business. So that's the idea of operating cash. Is the same is true for companies, is that there's just some amount of cash that a company can never pay out, right? So net debt is a misnomer. It is completely unrealistic to take debt minus cash. You can't give all of your cash to the debt holders, right? It just wouldn't happen. Because for example, if you were to go bankrupt, right, the first people to get paid are the lawyers. Then the government's going to want their unpaid taxes. Then you got to pay the unpaid wages. Then you got to pay your suppliers. Then you get to the secured lenders. So I'm just telling you, there is no circumstance where a company will ever be able to pay all of its cash back out to the debt holders. It just won't happen. And even if they went bankrupt, it couldn't happen. So we will make shortcuts in the real world. You were taught a shortcut that people use in the real world. In this class, we're going to get more granular. Now, it doesn't mean that if you go work at your first banking job that you tell your partners that they're wrong, they'll get you fired on arrogance. But what I'm telling you is at least you'll know that they're taking a shortcut when you're going through these analytics because we're going to do it the more academic way. So back to this. So operating cash, one, excess cash, two. But for purpose of this example, we're just going to call it operating because it's a very simple example. All right, inventory. <coughs> is it operating or non-operating? Operating if it goes to customers, so inventory is basically what they're buying, so that's one. Property, plant, equipment, operating or non-operating? One or two. Well, we manufacture the goods in a plant, that's obviously operating, so that's a one. Equity investment in another business? That's a two. Microsoft buys a piece of Facebook, right? They don't run Facebook, they just happen to own a piece of Facebook, made a lot of money off of it. But that's the point. It's non-operating. Okay? Has value, just valued separately. We'll call that a two. You don't value the totals. Accounts payable. Part of working capital. It's going to be a one. It's operating. And I'll give you the distinction. Interest bearing debt is a three. 
If it's non-interest bearing, it's probably accounts payable or something like that. If it's interest bearing, then it's financing, it's debt. That's the distinction that we will use, right? And then finally, retained earnings. One, two, three, or four. That's equity, right? So again, very simple statement. The one you'll have more complex, but this is the process that you will go through. Now, this question came up at the end of last class. For purposes of the midterm, for purposes of the homework, I'm going to give you the labels, right? So I'll tell you what the labels are. But the reason why I'm mentioning the labeling process is very soon, when we go to real world statements, somebody's going to give you statements that you don't know what the labels are. And you're going to open up, you know, P and G statement, it's going to say other assets. And we got to figure out, is that operating or is that non-operating? Because right, the companies don't tell us, the accounts don't tell us, so we're going to have to figure that stuff out. So that's why I want to get this in the back of your mind, that these are square pegs that we have to put into round holes as we go through these statements. All right, but nonetheless, I'll give it to you for the midterm. But this is an important process, and here's how it will help you. So now we want to create a new tab. I recommend, when you do these assignments, one tab per answer. Okay, it just be easier to grade and easier for you to do. It also allows you to cut and paste, which is what I'm about to do. So the years, co copy and paste them. Copy, paste the years. So now what I do is I assemble my Legos. Take all of my ones, all my operating assets, net of my operating liabilities. So cash, inventory, PP&E, and liability ones equals accounts payable. <clears throat> Notice how all my ones are together. All right, and this is the other reason why labels are helpful, because it shows I put all my operating items together. Okay, so what is my, in this case, uh, invested <coughs> capital, or actually I'm going to add a word in front of it, distinguish what is my operating invested capital. That's a better way of saying this. It's going to be the sum of the assets minus any liabilities. 380, 440. So very quickly, we have invested capital. That's how much is tied up in the operating assets. Right? Now I need to do the same thing for the non-operating items. Do I have any twos? Do I have any twos in the asset side? Equity investments. Do I have any twos in the liability side? No. But you will on your midterm and on your homework. Okay, so just like we net the liabilities against the assets for the operating, we do the same thing for the non-operating. We don't have any here, so non operating capital equals assets minus liabilities since we only have assets 15 and 25 so then we have TFI total funds available to investors is the operating invested capital plus the non operating capital 395 and 465 okay so now we go to the other side of the statement the threes and fours how are we financing those assets, okay? This is the rearranged financing or funds flow side of the statement. So we're financing them with debt. So do I have any debt? The answer is yes. Those are my threes. And do I have any equity? And the answer is yes, retained earnings. Those are my fours. And when I add up my threes and fours, I think so. When I add up my threes and fours, notice balance, balance. This is what I mean by balancing. Okay? So in this class, very important. Let's say for some strange reason you forgot to put your twos in here. That's an incorrect answer. Even though one of those two numbers is correct, and even though when I ask on the exam, I might say, put in the TFI 
for this year and you put in the right answer because you had a 50-50 probability of getting it right, you still get a zero for the question, right? Because you only had a 50-50 probability of getting it right. You don't know if 395 or 380 is the right answer. Even if you put in 395, that's still a guess. The only way you know 395 is the answer is if both sides balance. So that is true throughout the entire semester. And that's what I mean by balancing statements. Because if we only do one side, we don't know if we made a mistake. If you balance it, you clearly know you made a mistake. And this is where labeling can help you. Because when I'm searching for what mistake did I make, oh, I forgot to put in my twos. I don't see any twos here. I saw twos on the other statement. Or I have four ones on the other statement, but only have three ones on this statement. So I forgot a one. And that's where labels can actually be very helpful in this process. So that's the point. Let's undo, undo. And now we have a statement. We have basically 380 of operating assets, 15 of non-operating, which is 395, which is financed by 225 of debt and 175 of equity. Okay, just cleaner use of the statements mapped immediately on email. Questions? So again, the non-operating cash flow are just equity minus non-operating <coughs> The non-operating assets, non-operating capital, not cash flow. It's just non-operating assets minus non-operating liabilities. So operating assets minus operating liabilities. Okay, there just wasn't any in this example for the non-operating. All right, statement number two, rearranged income statement is called TII, total income available to investors. All right, so I'm going to copy the years. Copy and pasting will save you a lot of time and be necessary to complete these assignments. So we got to label our income statement. Start out with revenue. Operating, non-operating. Yeah, it's coming from customers, so it's probably operating. Operating costs, so ma manufacturing products sold. Operating. Depreciation. No. Where does depreciation come from in the balance sheet? It's a cost allocation, but it's not actually cash. But what is depreciation coming from? PP&E. So therefore, if it's the same account in the balance sheet, same account in the income statement, it's operating the balance sheet, operating the income statement. It's got to be a one. I don't like shortcuts, but here's one I'll let you take. Operating profit. We don't do the sum of the categories, but nonetheless, since everything above operating profit by definition should be operating, then you could start here in your conversion. So instead of putting in revenue, operating cost, depreciation, we could just start with operating profit. All right. I'm not going to play around in the midterm or homework. Like You can start there. In the real world, though, we got to be careful. Because in the real world, an accountant could throw something that's non-operating into the operating profit line. You've got to be careful for that. So nonetheless, for here, I'm not going to trick you as you start to think about the statements. So therefore, as a shortcut, we can start with operating profit. Interest expense. One, two, three, or four. Three, because it matches to the debt. What if it were interest income? It would actually be a two. Why would it be a two? Because it's... Uh... And where does the interest income come from? From, the, from a holding that's not part of you. It's yeah, it comes from holding the excess cash, which would also be a non-operating mm -hmm. asset. So that's the point. Here's another shortcut. People will do a net interest expense. They'll take interest income minus interest expense, net interest expense. But what they're actually doing is they're merging or commingling non-operating cash flows with debt cash flows. Right? And that's what I'm saying. You'll quickly get that insight mm -hmm. in this class. Not saying it's wrong. It just happens to be a shortcut for the way they decided to do that. Right? But in this class, we will separate it out more by the type that it really is. Okay, equity income. Microsoft's ownership stake in Facebook. You get some dividends on that. One, two, three, or four. That would be a two. Tax. Income tax. One. It's also a two. It's also a three. So one of the things we're going to do is we're going to split out the tax impacts to the areas of Medigliani Miller. We'll still have the same taxes, but we're going to look at the same tax impact in each of the areas. Right? Finally, net income belongs to the shareholders. That's a four. Now, dividends are the cash flow of the shareholders. However, on the TII, the statement actually ends with net income. 
So if you try to put dividends, which are coming off the statement of cash flow, into your income statement, you'll never balance your TII, okay? Because the TII stops with net income, okay? It's, it's income statement only statement. So back to this, TII. Start out shortcut operating income, operating profit. That was our one. I suggest writing this out granularly because the book doesn't always do this. So if we reported 280 of income and our tax rate was 25%, which is the assumed tax rate I gave you on the tab, tax on operating profit, profit <clears throat> is basically 25% of the 280. <clears throat> so our no pat or McKinsey calls this no plat. Those are pretty much interchangeable terms. No plat's the McKinsey term, no pat's the rest of the world generic term. Basically is 210. I make 280, I pay 70 in taxes, I have 210 of after tax profit from operating that tax. Okay? <clears throat> I do the same thing with my non-operating activities. So <clears throat> I have my twos, equity income. I make four million of equity income. I have tax on non-operating income equals that times the 0.25 after tax non-operating income. TII, the operating plus the non-operating, 213. Now here's why I'm writing this out. Happen to know one of the authors of the book was just actually working with him on this Google program. His name is Dave Wessels. <clears throat> he is now a professor at Wharton. He wrote a lot of the edits of the fifth, sixth edition. So here's my problem with what Dave did. He's a real smart guy, but it's so ingrained in him by working at McKinsey as long as he did that if you actually look at the example in the book that I'm following here for the TII, you'll see a four here. You'll see a three here. And you wonder how the four became a three, right? In his mind, it's intuitive to take equals the income pre-tax times one minus the tax rate, and that's your after-tax income, right? But what I'm telling you is for your own benefit, it might be helpful to be more granular. I make this income. I pay this tax. This is what's left. Now, if you want to be, well, like I said, you want to sport through a shortcut, you want to say after-tax non-operating income is equity income times one minus tax rate, Great, have at it. But I'm just telling you, it will help you as you go through the process to clearly see what's happening here. And what I'm saying is, I think Dave, when he did that chart, did a little disservice because it's just so intuitive to him that you do that, but it's not intuitive to the person who's never seen this before that that's what was done. But that's actually how the four became a three in the book, right, in the example we're doing, right? So we have TII. Here's the other thing you just gotta wrap your heads around. This is not accounting, okay? This is Medigliani Miller, it's a completely different world. The way these statements were set up for both the income and the cash flow. If I have income, I distribute the income. If I lose money, I borrow the loss. Okay? Therefore, positive income available to investors is going to be distributed and they have to match. Therefore, distributions are positive numbers. Negative losses of income have to be financed. They have to match. Therefore, any financing that the business does is a negative number on this statement. It's not an absolute value number. It's literally they have to match. Okay, so here's what I mean by that. When we do our threes and fours, my three was the interest expense of $20, $20 million. Is that a positive or a negative number? Given what I said, should that on this statement be a positive or a negative number? It's a distribution. 
Therefore, I have 213 of cash. I therefore have 20 to distribute. It's a positive number. I can only tell you that this is something you'll have to use your common sense on because different statements <clears throat> give it to you in different formats. Okay, and you have to think about what the number should be doing when you come up with the sign on, on this reorganized statement. Okay, so that's our interest expense. Except what I want is not the 20. What I want is there's going to be a tax yield. I can still deduct as a company interest as a cost of doing business. So I'm going to deduct the 20 at a 25% tax rate, and I'm going to save $5 million in tax yield. So my after-tax interest expense <coughs> is 15. And then my equity cash flow is my net income. It's my four. Three plus four match. I have 213 of profit. I distribute 15 to the debt holders. I distribute 198 of the profit to the shareholders. Right? And the 213 of profit came 210 from operations, three from non operating activities. That's Medigliani Miller. That's the clean lines we now have into the company's financial performance. Questions about that? This is what I mean by matching. <laughs> yes? So here's what I'm saying, <clears throat> and it's hard for the people that are watching this on video to see, but I'm holding in my hand a $20 bill. So my example is this. I'm the company, hypothetically. You are the sole shareholder, okay? I make $20, right? I give you, the shareholder, $20. The statement's got to balance. So I have 20. How do I balance with you of 20? Do I put it as positive or negative? negative. No, because I have positive 20 on one side, negative 20 on the other side. The only way it's going to balance is if I have positive 20 and I give you 20, so my distribution use a positive 20, right? If I needed 20 from you, you'd be out 20, negative 20, and I would have to record that as negative 20 to me, and that would actually be an increase in my equity, right? Because that would be the point. I'm funding the increase in equity because I'm out of cash. So it's a negative cash flow to you, the investor, and it's a positive cash flow to the firm. Right, so therefore, sorry, negative cash flow to the firm because it's basically negative financing. So I'm saying this is not accounting, and what's going to screw you up is you're going to think of statement of cash flows, and you got to get that out of your mind because this ain't that. Okay, this is a completely different statement, Manigliani Miller, and this is true for TFI. This is true for CFI, or sorry, TII CFI. So positive cash flow, positive numbers on the distribution side. Negative cash flow, negative income, negative numbers on the financing side. Okay, that's just the way these statements are structured. All right, other questions? Yes. Yeah, so you, could you just think about this in, as like these are the statements with respect to you as the like, financer or like that? Yes, yeah, that is the perspective that we're taking. That's exactly the way I think about this. Okay. All right, here's the one that's going to be a little bit more difficult, which is CFI. And this is where you will struggle more. Let's start out with the years. The process for cash flow to available to investors is very straightforward. You're going to do it four times, once per section. Cash flow from the income statement minus change in the balance sheet. Right? Because if you think about an income statement, it's a period statement, things that happen over a period of time. A balance sheet's a snapshot statement. So basically, the income statement explains what happens between two snapshots. So it's snapshot balance sheet one, income statement, snapshot balance sheet two, result of the income statement. That's essentially what accounting is doing. So <clears throat> when you go through these statements, we got to look at both the income statement and the balance sheet to do the cash flow. That's why you have to do both of those first two first. So let's start out. To get to gross cash flow, TII, 
Start out with your dough plat. Then we add back depreciation, non-cash item. No plat plus depreciation. equals gross cash flow. That's the gross cash flow from the income statement. So again, just practically, we subtract depreciation to a lower basis for taxes. We pay taxes, but it was a non-cash item, so that's why we're adding it back. Okay. So this is how much cash profit they made from the income statement. Then the gross investment is the reinvestment back into the balance sheet. So, how do we do that? Well, the reinvestment in the balance sheet is, off the TFI, the difference in the, for operating purposes, the current operating invested capital, so that's C6, why Excel doing this, minus TFI B6, so current minus previous year, so that's our gross investment, okay? Except what we're then gonna do is we're gonna add in our TII um, data. We're gonna add in our depreciation. <coughs> it's a negative number, I need to double negative it to add it. So we're going to have 80 of gross investment, okay? So that's just the formula from the book. Change in operating invested capital plus current year's depreciation is your gross investment, okay? So that will get you your free cash flow, which is the 230 minus the 80, okay? Then we'll do our non-operating cash flow. Off the income statement, TII, <clears throat> what is that? After tax non-operating income. So we had three million of after tax non-operating income. Then change in the balance sheet, in the balance sheet. So change in non-operating capital. Our non-operating capital went from 15 to 25, increased by 10. What is it? It's 15 to 25, increased by 10. Now, question about the signs. Again, I don't have a good way of saying this, otherwise you gotta think this through. Back to the name of the statement. Cash flow available to pay investors, CFI, okay? If we make $3 million of after-tax non-operating income, does that add to the cash flow available to pay investors or does that take away? We're gonna add that in. If I increase my purchase of non-operating assets by $10 million, does that add to the cash flow available or does that take away? Takes away. So this is gonna be a negative. This is what I mean by using common sense to think through the signs. So my CFI is going to be the sum of these three line items, 143. Now, on the financing fl funds flow financing side, I got to balance the 143. So again, my cash flow to the debt holders, TII, is my after-tax interest expense. Of the 143 of cash I had available, I paid net of 15 to the interest expense, right? Then change in debt. My debt went from 225 to 200. So did I borrow debt or pay off debt? Paid off 25. That's a distribution to the investor so is that a positive or negative 25? That's a positive 25. Flip the sign. Okay. 
Next trick, equity. Net income is not the cash flow that's distributed to the investor. What is the cash flow that's distributed to the investor called? Dividends. Dividends. So here's the trick to the CFI, first of two tricks. Trick number one, dividends, not net income. On the TII, you use net income because you're balancing an income statement. But in the cash flow statement, the net income is not what's paid to the shareholder. Therefore, we need the dividends. So the cash flow to the shareholder is the dividends. And because that's a distribution to the shareholder, that should be a positive number. And then we have change in other equity accounts off the balance sheet. So change in equity, which is basically changed in retained earnings. And retained earnings went from 170 to 265. So equity went up. So technically that should be an inflow. So that should be a negative. So if we now add up these, we should get 143. And with the balancing statement, we are done. No, it should be 143. So I made a mistake. This doesn't balance. Oh, maybe I have the wrong sign here. Nope. So this is why you can't just manipulate numbers for three hours and hope you get a final answer. Because if I keep changing it, it doesn't actually balance. So what's the problem here? What is retained earnings? Of equity. Okay. Is it a cash account? No. So if I have a change in a non-cash account, does that affect cash flow? No. There you go. Don't put changes in non-cash accounts on a cash flow statement because then your cash flow will never balance. Change of retained earnings has no impact on cash flow. So there's the, the other trick number two. So trick number one is dividends, not net income. Trick number two, don't put in change and retained earnings because changes in non-cash accounts do not affect cash flow. And I'm telling you, if you don't do those two things, you'll never get to this balance. And then you either complete the homework assignment in an hour or you complete it in five hours and give up. This is the five hours and give up problem. So I'm letting you know now how not to give to take five hours to do this. Okay. By the way, skip this earlier. If I go back to my TII, this is why balancing is important. <coughs> How much tax did we pay off the original income statement? 66. Even when we rearrange the tax, how much tax are we paying on non-operating activities? Or operating activities? Non-operating activities? What's 70 plus 1? We save 5 in a tax yield. What's 71 minus 5? 66. So that's the point. We're still representing matching taxes. We're just splitting them out to the areas that they impact. Much more insightful. Because now I know how much I say by having debt in my cap structure. It's very clear for doing that. All right. Final statement. Economic profit. EP. <coughs> this is McKinsey's version of EVA because basically we can't call it EVA because Stern Stewart has a trademark on it. So the non-trademark term is called economic profit. Okay. So economic profit, really straightforward to calculate. Again, matching two methodologies. Copy over the years. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to take our no plats. And then we're going to take our invested capital. The operating invested capital and we're going to calculate what's called a BOY which stands for beginning of year ROYC this is what's on the homework this is what's on the midterm what does that mean it means we take our current year no plat and we divide by previous year invested capital that's BOY if we said end of year current year no plat divided by current year capital okay? You can do that. You can do an average. 
We're going to, just going to choose BOY so we can consistently do it, and it will match the valuations. So that's the ROIC of the operating part of the business for the current year. Okay? So I'll give you a whack. I forgot to put one in this simple example, but let's say I'll give you the whack of 10%. So you'll come up with a spread, which is the ROIC minus the whack. So that's your spread. <laughs> hate this keyboard. All right, so I got the spread. And then finally, what is my economic profit? It's my spread times my beginning of year invested capital. Or method two, I take my no plat And I subtract what's called a capital charge. Can't spell charge. So what is a capital charge? Well, I'm tying up 380 capital, beginning of year, times a 10% whack. I need to make 38 to pay back the investors their expectations. I made 210. The difference. One seventy-two. Okay, so one's called the spread method, ROIC minus WAC times capital. One's called the capital charge method, no plat minus capital charge equals economic profit. They balance four statements, four balancing statements. That's going to be your next homework. This is exactly midterm one. The only difference you got ninety minutes next Monday. So practice so that you're prepared for the ninety minutes. Questions? After the midterm, we'll talk about the analytics and how this then turns into evaluation. Right? But nonetheless, we're doing play companies before the midterm. Afterwards, we get very real world. Homework two is going to be more complex than this. I'll give you the labels. Finished by Friday, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Later Friday, look at practice midterm. Right. Between those two and the other practice solution, plus this was recorded as a video, <clears throat> that should hopefully prepare you for next Monday's midterm. Again, you'll take it during class time. Right, Click on the link on Elms for midterm one. Complete it, submit it, upload your com converted file, type in a couple of key numbers so we can auto-grade it, and then basically you'll get the answer immediately and know how you do. But basically you have to do that during class on Monday, okay? And it'll be similar to what you're gonna do in homework two on Friday. Yes? So you class or So for the midterm, you can do it wherever you want. Just subject to the honor code. You just have to do it during class time. Because the idea of me coming in here and watching you for 90 minutes, head down at a keyboard, it doesn't seem to be helpful. But the flip side is, I am potentially opening up to honor code violations by doing it, but I assume you guys are pretty trustworthy people, so just don't do it. Okay. So, any other questions? So again, logistics. Wednesday, Bloomberg, here, all day. Take advantage of that in terms of not just the class, but if anybody wants recruiting, talk to them. They're the recruiters. Even if you're a junior is rising, you're looking for internships. Number two, uh, get your homework two done by Friday. Check out the practice midterm over the weekend. During class time on Monday, take the midterm, which is just this converted. That's all it's gonna be. Here's a data tab with labels probably three years of data, and then just copy and paste, create those four tabs that match and balance. And the next Wednesday is our next lecture. Everybody clear? Okay, we're done. I just, I'm interested about the exam. So the exam, you're going to give us an Excel spreadsheet.